Good afternoon and welcome to the Modern Marketing Confluence, a DAN and MMA initiative, a platform to discuss and debate growth hacks and to bring to you curated and rich insights from industry experts, marketers, and partners. I'm Monica Khurana, MMA India Country Head and your host for today. We bring to you part two of the Thursday series of Modern Marketing Confluence. This series couldn't be better time given the new normal we are all living in. It is the era of modern marketing. The marketer is upskilling to adopt modern marketing techniques as organizations dabble with first party data strategy, D2C, and cloud for marketing as must haves for marketing plans to succeed. These changes in the environment make it imperative for a marketer to be equipped as he leads digital transformation from the front, as well as manages customer retention and engagement. Hence, it's important that MMA enables the expertise and learnings for the same. So before we begin the session today, let me share with you various initiatives MMA is taking to enable the modern marketing journey. We have put together an advisory council and an in-house MarTech expert to educate marketers to build capabilities and to provide best practices to better understand modern marketing growth hacks. We have recently released an industry survey to share a view of the current gaps and opportunities in MarTech. We would urge you to participate in the survey and share your views and inputs with us to enable us to better represent the insights garnered and ensure adoption of the right MarTech stacks. Let's take a glimpse of what the series encompasses and what's coming your way. Can we have the video, please? So the topic for today, as you all know, is D2C strategy. The session is being strived, uh, being, sorry, the session is being streamed live on MMA social media handles, primarily YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Do share it with your friends and colleagues who can view the same live. This session is an attempt to, to address some of the following key things. A, to de-jargonize D2C and address some absolute fundamentals. B, to share cross-category insights from across e-commerce, FMCG, auto, and BFSI. C, to touch upon personalization and customization. And D, to enable, uh, to enable a view on omni-channel marketing. So before we begin, some quick housekeeping rules. Do feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like. There is a question, uh, there is a question section in your toolbar below. Kindly use only that particular section to ask your questions and not the chat window. When you are asking your question, please share your name, your designation, your company name. And if there is a preference for a particular speaker to answer your question, this will help us contextualize the response effectively for you. With that, let me introduce you to our keynote speaker for the day. Vikas Purohit, CEO, Tata Click. Vikas has immense experience in the category of retail, fashion, and e-commerce, and has worked with leading organizations in the past like Amazon, Reliance, and Aditya Burla Group. 
he believes in creating organizations which are circles and not pyramids and calls himself a student of organization 3.0. Vikas, that's a very interesting one. Would you want to share on how you practice being a student of organization 3.0 with us before I proceed with introducing you further? Thank you, Manika. Thanks a lot. Um, I think uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and a uh, pleasure to be with the audience. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, organization 3.0 is nothing but um, a day bag decision making in what you want to do in the organizations. For a very, very long time, um, science knows something and management does something else. I think that marriage has not happened and uh, we still work on a factory based uh, um, approach to an organization and there is a slide which I'll be covering in my keynote when I talk about how we look at ourselves, the employees and how it is still fundamentally no different than 1920s Ford factory. Uh, so uh, yes, I don't think there is any rocket science there. I don't think there is any it's just uh, some inquisitive people who have gone down this journey of polar crazy. Uh, and they are discovering that um, the success will be when you ask someone to design an uh, how how is your organization structured. The yeah. first thing people is they start drawing these boxes. Box one, followed by box three, followed by box three or whatever. Or they draw a pyramid. Uh, the day they start drawing circles is when organization 3.2 will become reality. The day they say that um, it doesn't matter. Uh, it is, my skill set is what matters and not the function. And so, so it's a very interesting field. It's full of using data to do things. It's full of the fancy concepts which are no more old, uh, two decades old of agile. Um, but yes, it's very difficult to execute uh, because our mind has been tuned to a particular way of management. So. Absolutely. Thanks for explaining that. And I think that's a very valuable, uh, uh, you know, insight for today and very relevant to what we're going to talk about today. But I'm going to tell you a little more about Vikas. The lockdown has brought out the hidden chef in Vikas and the passion for cooking has led him to ensure a finesse to a point where food looks photo shoot ready. That's quite amazing. He is a firm believer in connecting with his customers and personally addressing several queries, which he uses to learn and improve in ways with, in which customers are served. Today, he's going to take us through his thoughts and learnings in building a D2C orientation in the organization, as well as sharing the journey in terms of how Tata Click has gone about it. So over to you, Vikas, and welcome once again. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, I trust the slide is visible. Yes, it is Vikas. Okay. Um, so uh, I think the holy grail of n equal to one has been uh, discussed for a decade now. We all know personalization, recommendation uh, in very different manners. And while we say something, we go and do something. And that's what we will um, we will kind of discover. Uh, as much as I am. Uh, as I am uh, kind of tempted uh, because of low marketing budgets that we have to pitch a, uh, for Tata Click and download the app now. I will not do that and I'll refrain from that because it's, uh, uh, it's not about what we are doing today. It's about what we are not able to do today. Um, primarily because we are getting our data sets right. We are building our data lake. We are building our capabilities to look at a uh, audience platform. Uh, but let me start with a very interesting example. Uh, just imagine uh, we, we are going down to, and, and I know we can't imagine this in this scenario, but let's assume next year we decide to go down and have a tennis match with a resident in our society. And two of us just finish a call and say, okay, come and let's meet at the tennis court and play a game. And just before stepping out, um, I look at my console and I say, okay, Google, get me an insurance for my ankle for next uh, fracture for next uh, two and a half hours. Uh, now, what happens? What happens in the background? In the background, uh, there is a check on all the photographs that I have uploaded uh, on playing tennis. Uh, my shopping behavior, have I bought shoes which were fit for tennis? All my medical record that um, how many times I have had issues with my ankle. 
climatic conditions whether it is uh, going to be moist humid or drizzling in this area where i am playing uh, records of nearby hospitals where people have been uh, kind of admitted for sports related injury and all of these are test kind of uh, looked at in real time and um, i get a, a quote uh, from google saying that hey we found xyz insurance company here is the quote for the next two and a half hours you have to pay whatever rupees uh, and here is your insurance uh, that is an equate one uh, it's and look at what it does to our ability to serve the customer at the right point of time with the right amount of money because you tell me to buy a health insurance throughout the year or a specific sports injury insurance throughout the year i'll not do it but you make it so easy that every time i'm going to play um, and if i can if i can just ask for a 2 hour insurance hey i'll not mind spending that 49 59 89 or whatever uh, 199 rupees and this can be taken further ahead this can be then sold as an api all of this data can be sold as an api to the hospital saying that we can tell you the probability of number of people who might come to your hospital today with a ankle injury it this api can be sold to an insure uh, uh, to a ambulance service saying that you should have an ambulance placed in this area in the city today because there is a high probability of a fracture or whatever uh, none of this is uh, none of this is sci-fi anymore all of this is possible uh, somehow we have cluttered our uh, tech stack so much that we are not able to do it um but uh, i don't think any single panelist here or any single person in the audience will say that oh my god this is uh, like sci-fi no this is doable uh so yeah uh, this is the age of data and surprisingly a lot of us still believe a telescope looks like the one on far left uh, and with a lot of uh, pictures of a deceased actor looking through a telescope we believe that a telescope looks like that but uh, hey uh, i think uh, i want you to focus on the picture which is in the middle this is the sloan digital sky uh, this telescope was created in 2000 in new mexico and in 3 weeks it collected data which the entire history of astronomy has not collected i'm talking about 3 weeks it took 3 weeks to collect that much of data and then it continued for 10 years and uh, moore's law kicked in and um, world came up with a synoptic survey telescope uh, which in 5 days collected the data that sloan digital sky had collected in whatever 10 years um now this is the amount of data we have today um you look at the uh, human genome um when it was decoded in 2003 it took 10 years to sequence the 3 billion base pairs um in 2016 a facility could have done it in a day today i am told that this can be done in an hour um and uh, that's the power of uh, that's a power residing with us and that's the data residing with us what is left um is very simple what is left is um uh, some people call it magic and i call it maths and we will come to that and that's the point which uh, perhaps i would want to focus on what happens with so much of data sure there is so much of data so what and uh, my favorite example always and always is uh, a very prominent retailer who who in a meeting uh, got upset with someone saying that um, data cannot measure the emotions of the customers walking into the stores and hence uh, i am not a big fan of data uh, my belief is um, that form uh, completely changes function uh, we used to take pictures uh someone came up with the idea to run the pictures very fast in our eyes with at 24 48 96 frames per second the moment the person did that we realized oh it looks like motion um and uh, very soon it became a video uh, which is nothing but a lot of pictures um uh, at a certain frame per second uh there is no difference between a photo and a video it's the quantum of data which is a difference um it's a quantum of pictures which when moved at a particular speed looks like a video and um, we both means all of us know the difference between a picture and a video and how much more communicative and how much more emotional and how much more things can be done with that uh so uh 
also imagine what was happening in 2000 some people were working on uh, some people were working on auto correct and they were not able to get it right um, and uh, they the only thing that they did is they increase the number of words from a million to 10 million to 100 million and to a billion and that came the accuracy up to 95% um so uh, the quantum of data today does a lot of things i have in the middle an example of um, google uh, and google's contribution to 2009 h1n1 influenza where uh, it's a very famous case study on how they helped the entire country uh, be prepared with the right amount of uh, vaccines at the right pin codes because um, uh, there was the data of finding out where the probability was highest of uh, infection because what basis what people in aggregate were searching in an anonymized manner right most is um, the father of network effect and this is elbert uh, laszlo uh, he studied the telephone data of one fifth of an entire country's population and came up uh, with a theory that more diversity creates sticky networks and diversity is about age diversity is about gender diversity was about religion diversity was about socio economic strata and so on and so forth but he was able to do this because of the amount of data available uh, and uh, that's what actually is available with all of us so if if all of us today look at and uh, to the extreme left where the guy is driving a car is a very simple example how we sit on a car seat uh, creates 360 pressure points and each uh, uh, each one of us has a very unique uh, signature when we sit of those 360 pressure points so uh, much before uh, google or uh, others cracked this problem through mobile phones of unlocking a car or unlocking an engine someone said why don't we use this pressure point signature that a car will be unlocked or an engine can be started only when the owner with exactly same uh, signature sits on the seat that's when the car automatically starts then someone else came in and said that great why can't we also provide information about a medical condition because um, it changes basis um, if we are sick our signature points uh, the way we sit changes then someone else came and integrated it with insurance companies and said that why don't we integrate it with insurance companies because you can make out whether the driver was, was alert or was sleeping or about to sleep feeling drowsy and if the person was feeling drowsy or was sleeping then the insurance should be declined and so on and so forth just look at the amount of things which this large data and an ability to compute uh, with this large data can uh, generate for us and uh, that is what this uh, set of people who are sitting here today must be excited about um, and uh, there must be some disappointment of how much we have been able to do till now but uh, infinite excitement about how much we can do in the next one decade i believe uh, 2030 um, these discussions will not even be discussions i i we will see very very different things being done with the data this is my favorite uh, picture um, what so what has happened with the, we have today so much of data that data is being transformed into actionable insights through use of computing power um and what has it done um it has resulted in the demise of experts or so called experts so this is the famous moneyball scene uh the oakland scouts uh, are sitting team scouts are sitting together and discussing a player and um, the statements are have you seen his biceps and then someone says oh he hangs around with this baseballer and then the third person says but i think his girlfriend is not pretty so i think he is low on self esteem so and that's how they are discussing the uh, they are discussing about whether a player should be included in the team or not today uh, even an ipl i think averages just don't matter we used to all look at um, those strips of data saying that tendulkar's average in um, one day is this and five days is this averages have absolutely no meaning today you actually have data points of saying which climatic conditions Uh, uh what kind of soil or pitch what kind of a bowler was it a fast bowler or a spin bowler was it a right hand versus a left hand bowler, bowler? uh you have infinite amount of data was it off spin versus leg spin and you 
you are able to create a team which is fit for that particular match against those particular opponents uh and someone who might be having great averages might not make the uh cut because this set of opponents um his uh data proves that he is not good playing against them or our best chance is not playing this player against this set of opponent so uh so this is how this is how uh data changes things it makes human beings um who are definitely not a six sigma machine um it asks us to step back let machines take decisions our job is to evaluate uh, whether the outputs are going right and adjust the inputs but uh, it's a matter of time that more and more decisions will shift to machines i'm i'm staying away from all the debates of uh, ai taking over but uh, i'm staying away from all the debates of you can you what will happen to privacy i am staying out of debates on all of those because to me those are basics we as marketers have a role to play um we were doing a poc with an organization from israel and um, on our app and uh, they gave us a poc on uh, six of us uh, we said okay uh, can we look at it on our, our apps and six of us started using that app for a month after a month the app could give us results and all the normal results what my day looks like how much i play and this and this my health and so on and so forth they were able to tell me what um, car i drive whether i drive or i am driven by a chauffeur um, what other gadgets i have in my house um, and this is simple which wifi you connect to it just picks up you connect to a bose it just fills in that the guy has a bose speaker at the home and you connect it to the car um, it figures out which car you are driving i still don't know how they figure out whether i am driving or i am being driven but um, it was some immense data but uh, it was definitely not ethical so we decided not to go ahead with that primarily because we felt it's it's just uh, it's not correct this is not something that uh, and this was 2 years back so uh, the data protection laws are still not in picture but um there is a tata code of conduct and we applied it and said that that's not something which we will want to do so what is this n equal to 1 right uh, there is no magic so this whole thing of uh, overuse of word artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on and so forth um no n equal to 1 is nothing about a machine becoming a predictor of future it's pure math which is applied to a huge pool of data i'm using the word carefully relevant data uh in order to infer the probability of a particular event at a point of time uh what it does is it moves the discussions completely from causation to correlation my favorite example is uh one of the european countries uh, uh research was done where they studied cancer patients for more than 10 years and um, they studied every single aspect of the cancer patients and every single data was fed into a uh, into a computer and finally there was a correlation the correlation was number of people who had higher amount of orange in their diet as a orange as a fruit um recovered much more and there was a correlation which was coming up uh, on that now uh there is no causation no one is saying that if if you eat oranges you will um you will recover from cancer that's not the point here but what the data is telling you is that hey do you want to go and look there there is a correlation we can see a certain certain amount of work happening between uh, people who have higher amount of orange in their diet and the probability of coming back from cancer and you can come back and say that no it was fluke um versus us saying and and my favorite example is one of the companies i worked for in the past where they completely refused to take gender and age data from the customer the whole concept was um if i take your gender and age data i become biased because i will start having a hypothesis to offer oh you are a man so i am my age is 40 plus i am a guy i know if 
uh, a marketer who uses these two data point or these three data point there is a professional who spends 12 hours at work um this is a professional who's 40 plus engineer um i know what kind of things will come to me um there is um, i buy a lot of um means everything in the kitchen is bought by me um so um, i do look at all the kitchen items i buy a lot of things for my son um i buy a lot of things for my house because i am into uh, decorating the house and so on and so forth uh that's when uh, this company i worked for said that we don't care what age or what gender it's your behavior uh, which is going to uh, tell us that um, how do we uh, recommend things to you i this we work a lot with gartner and we actually attribute a lot of our success to gartner um, because of the partnership um, this is a gartner model uh, where if you can see how personalization can go from very basic where it's a channel consistency you show me the same face or same banner on your app and mobile uh, pwa and um, on a desktop to you start creating a product relationship or preferences to you start figuring out locations and behavioral pattern and finally you come to intent so one of the very famous retail companies in us um, uh, has said that they have figured out that every customer journey can be one of 100 journeys that they have crafted and their whole personalization job is to in three clicks figure out which journey this customer will belong to and then take the customer down that journey it's not an equal to one it uh, puts customer in one of the 100 uh, buckets but that's a one to few of um, the orange one which they are taking and yes these are the six components where uh data we are using to customize uh, personalize the customer experience we work a lot uh with google uh we are a very big believer in uh, uh, the digital marketing maturity model and we have made some significant gains working with them over last 8 months there is a team of six people whose only job is to continue working uh in taking us to the multi moment uh, category which i believe only 5 or 8% of the companies in the world are at today uh and what we have been able to do so this particular sale um uh, when we did the recent sale we were able to uh a woman in uh, chandigarh who was into music um got a very different creative on a performance marketing than a guy in bangalore uh who's into sports so they got different categories they got personalized messages saying hey in chandigarh the temperature is this much and do you want to do this or in chandigarh it's raining do you want to buy a music system to listen to your best songs versus in bangalore it was completely different so we understood the gender real time we understood the location real time we understood the preferences real time and um, the messaging in real time was very very different and there was a 14% uh, uplift in click through rates and um, um there is a full case study and we are driving that as a case study with an entire tata group um so there is a lot of work happening over there i just come to my last slide and this is this is um this is a picture of uh tata click employees you can see three generations here there are two people who are 24 year old there are few people who are 48 year 40 year old and there is a gentleman who's our chro he is 58 years old right so these are three generations sitting into this picture and just ask a very simple question and i'm talking about uh, personalization or n equal to 1 um what do our reward systems look like in our organization right uh, if someone does something we end up giving the same reward to every single one of them here is a spa voucher now i don't know whether these three generations in this photograph will have the same uh same amount of appreciation for a reward which is exactly the same irrespective of age gender lifestyle what happens to the leave policy does a 24 year old need the same leave policy versus a 58 year old what happens to a learning and development um, do they need the same kind of learning and development uh, approaches what happens to engagement um, that whole thing of saying come let's go for office party um, i for me you call me to a party i'll be like um, it will be a punishment for me uh but yes i have to do it because it's supposed to be engagement 
um, but there is no n equal to one there, and that's a, a, a question that which I have uh, with our HR. What happens to the comp structure? Um, a 22 year old needs money very differently than a 58 year old versus a 42 year old. But none of these are at n equal to one in most of the organizations. And think of the aha moment if if this slide is generating in our mind saying that, oh, I wish my organization does an n equal to one for each one of these. And then just map it to the customer. The customer will be equally delighted uh, if we create such aha moments for them. Um, so uh, that's that's it from my side. I I leave it to the experts here to debate. Um, I want to um, thank you for being a patient audience, and um, I will be listening to the panel discussion to get into the nuances. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Vikas. That is really, really enriching and very insightful. And what was most amazing is the, the storytelling and the use cases that you tried to very carefully pick and choose whilst doing this session for us. Uh, truly appreciate those examples. They were very, very meaningful and very, very uh, enriching. And I do like, I would, whilst I, I introduce the panelists, I would like to recap what you mentioned N equal to one is not about teaching, teaching machines to predict future. It is about applying maths to relevant data to infer probability of a particular event at a point in time. That's so well put. And of course, the motherhood point on machines take decisions, but humans exist to evaluate and adjust the output for it. So thank you for setting up the base perfectly for our panelists. Really appreciate your time. And uh, we, we look forward to having you engaged again. Uh, so, as I am sure the session has been hugely helpful to the audience so far, and now we deep dive into a panel discussion on the same subject, and, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our panelists for today, who are absolute experts in the space, carefully chosen, and also the practitioners who have been, who work closely with the marketeers to make D2C happen seamlessly. So, warm welcome to all our panelists. I'd like to have all of you put on your cameras as I'm going to introduce each one of you, but more in a non-LinkedIn style because enough of you is available for everyone to go and see on LinkedIn. So I don't want to introduce you with stuff that they already know. Let me tell them a little about what they don't know. So let me start with the lady in the room, Mega Tyagi, group head retail and government. She has close to two decades of experience, which comprises BFSI, retail, payments, and managing institutional businesses. And this all is amply detailed on LinkedIn. But what you don't know is she's a mother of two wonderful twins, which is a full-time job by itself, I must say. And in her meantime, she sketches and calls it meditative. It's her joyful way to rebalance and center herself. How wonderful is that, Mega? Welcome to the panel discussion. Thank you, Monica. Glad to be here. Pleasure. Uh, let me now introduce you to Zavid, who's VP Digital Transformation and Growth, Unilever, South Asia. He has 20 years plus experience with 19 years alone in Unilever's an institute of its, an institute of its own. Uh, Zavid has passion for outdoors, loves trekking, He's an aspiring golfer and a certified master scuba diver, which he uses to explore deep blue. I'm sure, I'm sure currently it's a big miss for him. Welcome, Zavid. Thank you, Monica. It's a delight to be here. Pleasure. Next, we have Harish Narayan, who's CMO Mintra. He's ex-PNG and ex-Google, and hence, I'm sure he's feeling at home here today amongst his colleagues. He's an active consumer of audiobooks and podcasts, which has enabled him to finish a book a week. The recent one being finished, atom uh, the recent one being Atomic Habits and Sapiens. The lockdown has also enabled him to build new habits around time management, enabling higher productivity and efficiency, leaving him with adequate time with his three year old daughter, who's apparently a riot. So, welcome, Harish. Nice to have you. Thanks, Monica. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a wonderful audience. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic. So let's drive 
view to the auto expert with us, who's Kaushik Prasad, General Manager, Consumer Marketing. He has close to two decades of experience and all through his career, he has been in the auto space. That's a phenomenal time to have spent in a single category. Kaushik loves reading and calls himself a bibliophile. He's a blogger and you can find his work on 30mlmusings.com. He also writes for several publications like TOI and Business World. Welcome, Kaushik. Thank you very much, Monica. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. Uh, it's going to be a great discussion. Absolutely. Next up is Lalit Bhagya, who's going to be with us the second time in the series. He's the CEO of Dan Consult and a co-partner to MMA for the Modern Marketing Confluence. Some interesting facts not visible on his LinkedIn. He is a doting father of two lovely children who do who we often see on our Zoom chats. And like Vikas, uh, Lalit has also used his lockdown effectively in developing culinary skills like baking. He is also learning the Gita, which is super profound, and I'm sure it becomes an enabler to solve a lot of or to get a lot of answers to complex complex issues in daily life. Last but not the least, he's doing a DJ course and has promised to perform sometime soon with, with MMA. So welcome, Lalit. Thanks, Monica. Excited to be here. Uh, I think it's a great initiative and look forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Now it's time to introduce you to our session chair, Manik Nangya. He's the Chief Operating Officer at Bharti Enterprises. Manik has two decades of diverse experience in banking and life insurance. He has navigated large businesses through strategic choices and with a highly progressive mindset, with data being the key pillar. We are glad to have him share the discussion today. And after interacting with him, I have gauged he's extremely high energy. He sets an instant comfort in a group. And most importantly, he has an excellent sense of humor. So you're sure to be entertained when he takes over the session. So over to you, Manik, and let's get it going. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. Really excited to be here. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon to this panel discussion. You know, as the lockdown started, um, and I began to wonder what exactly, what exactly we were going through, a couple of things sort of held or, or created milestones of introspection. The first, first such instant was that after after a couple of months when my driver bhaiya began to come back to work the first thing he started to do is to show me the arogya setu and to show me the green bar that said i'm safe the very fact that the very fact that he had the he had the compliance in him to have downloaded it and the wisdom to show it and create create a create a barrier create a benchmark for trust got me to think about one aspect of consumer behavior but i i wasn't too sure if he had if he had made the choice knowing that he was he was willing to share data to keep him keep himself safe and informed the second was when most friends began to wonder on whatsapp chats after two and a half months of the lockdown having been in, in place, why wouldn't Swiggy deliver beer? Because it would just be the simple thing to do instead of going and standing there in the queue. And that was another, mod, an, another moment when I began to think about delivery models and how some of that could change dramatically with the new world that we were living in. The third was when having now been a part of a multinational with Bharti on one side, AXA, the French multinational insurance company on the other, somebody preferred Zoom calls, some group preferred Microsoft Teams and some others were on Google Meet. And it was such a tough thing for, for some of us in the middle to try and negotiate UX and make that change seamlessly. I was wondering, Nobody ever told me, we will not do this meeting in this office because we don't like the surrounding of the meeting room. If you look carefully at some of these things, not only is the psychographic decision-making of, you know, 
the new meaning trust has assumed gets gets challenged but also the delivery models the ux the appreciation of the path to purchase and 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 suffice to say that we're we're in certainly very very interesting times evolving extremely fast with with some of this stuff going around us with that let me let me start the discussion with 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 megha and and megha you you get access to so much consumer insight with the shopping trends during the last 3 to 4 months the pace at which consumers have started to evolve what are the things that have surprised you what are the things that are unique to this pandemic situation and how do you see it folding sure thanks um, uh, manik for that and i i before i get started i think i i have to acknowledge i love when vikas uh, spoke about this example of uh, you know uh, someone discarding data uh, discarding uh, data saying that i it doesn't tap into consumer emotion or consumer sentiment but we believe uh, that data gives you that bird's eye view into consumer sentiment and especially when you look at you know platforms like google search it becomes a true barometer of uh, of consumer uh, mindset and what the consumer is thinking of so first things first uh, over the last 4 months have been most unprecedented i think everybody all of us sitting here are witnessing something of this everybody in our generation is witnessing something of uh, this scale for the first time so it's new for all of us and the biggest shift if you look at the consumer moments the biggest shi- shift has been in content consumption and it is the easiest reflection of that is in the amount of time that consumers or people are now spending in in content consumption on from an average of about 2 hours a day that indians and average indian would spend on a smartphone that time shifted to 4 and a half hours and now settling at around 4 hours on an average so it's doubled so to say so in the last 4 months content consumption has accelerated the most with video streaming and app downloads witnessing an all time uh, growth and and actually the core of it really is that if you look at digital digital has moved from being just purely a tool of curiosity and entertainment to a tool for sustenance and commerce uh, and and we see this behavior evolve on on google search uh, and if i can summarize quickly we we call these behavior as the three c's uh, you're seeing these consumers who are curious who are conscious and who are cautious so as people start using their devices as the primary medium to connect to the world curiosity we believe will become a strong trigger for commerce it has already started becoming a strong trigger for of commerce on google search we saw queries for uh, for things like home delivery kirane ki dukan near me grow almost 10x and even as the you know mobility options grow and cities begin to unlock they, we see these settling at about 2x of pre covid levels searches for you know categories like fashion and beauty decline but if you look at you know diy searches in the same category how to search in personal and beauty care they almost surged by 40% and guess what uh, 57% of these beauty mavens were men uh, when we look at a, a conscious consumer why are we saying that we'll we'll see a new wave of conscious consumers there is a fear of and it's it's easy to see around us there is a fear of potential income loss even if it is not real for a lot of people the environment makes these conversations very real so we are seeing an emergence of a more value conscious consumer and on the other hand if you look at the people with high disposable income uh, they are possibly discovering a world of minimalism i can survive in five t-shirts and a pair of shorts so consumer demand is not dead it is dormant but in certain categories it will have to be reignited um, so and when we look at you know even google search for categories like footwear search is continue to be you know uh, um, to command a really high share but the mix of these queries has changed drastically in favor of chappels versus branded sneakers and when i talk about a, a cautious consumer um, as we step out people are cautious about safety standards that businesses are are following right now on again on search on platforms like youtube interest in unboxing content 
or reviews is skyrocketing because people are using the time that they would have normally spent in a storeroom talking to a salesperson in doing their research online. So we expect this new cautious consumer to prioritize contactless shopping, to spend less time in store and come in into a store as a more knowledgeable uh, consumer knowing exactly what they want. And especially in everyday categories, we'll see this behavior shift, which we are already witnessing to a more list-based buying versus I'll go and browse and figure out what I want to pick up. Awesome. Awesome. Curious, conscious, and I'm cautious. Sure. I'd never have thought of, I'd never have thought of that. And neither did I, neither, neither did I think that, uh, that uh, like Vikas's example, people will start to ping Google on insurance. What a wow that is for an insurance professional that I am. You know, what is unique about the proposition is that, that we, sell, we sell something to people who think they don't need it. And then we hope they never need to use it. But, but moving on, the, the auto category, Kaushik, is, has been predominantly uh, physical. And, and while, while I know that there has been a lot of research online on that category, but, and, and like Mega said, some of that might have increased for you. But how, how have you dealt with this change? How, how have you seen consumer behavior evolve over these last three to four months? I know demand's picking up, but uh, help us understand some of the softer sides of consumer behavior that you've seen. Okay, so um, thanks. <clears throat> I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer in three parts. When, of course, COVID hit us, you know, with unprecedented, as, as many speakers have spoken about, uh, I think the, the single biggest question that we wanted to answer was actually KKH. And that's my favorite question. Uh, KKH stands for Karna Care. So we decided that, you know, we will stay true to the brand, what our brand stands for. So <clears throat> we decided to pursue, uh, we decided to uh, overemphasize empathy and, and consumer understanding uh, you know, over anything else. And that's it's consistent with what our brand believes in. Uh, that along with really you know, driving the business, right? With both together. <clears throat> uh, once, once that kind of became, uh, became kind of clear, uh, what really helped us is actually looking at consumer behavior in, in, in two lenses. What aspects, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. What aspects of the consumer behavior is new or is a new, is a new development? And what aspects of the consumer behavior got accelerated? So for example, researching online, potentially got accelerated. Uh, the need for consume, uh, need for convenience probably got accelerated. Uh, what was new was say, for example, uh, I'm okay with uh, you know, a WhatsApp video demo, 360 walk around of the car. That's new. I mean, we haven't seen that. Right? So we kind of put together some of these buckets, uh, some of the aspects of the consumer behavior in these two axes, what's new and what's, what's accelerated. And of course, it's no constant answer. It keeps evolving all the time. And that helped us evolve solutions uh, which were very empathetic, plus at the same time, keep driving business. So things like online booking, things like dial up Ford. I mean, you don't have to reach out. You don't need multiple numbers to reach to Ford. There's a single number, whether it's for service, whether it's for roadside assistance, whether it's for you know all requirements, one number. And enter your pin code and you'll be directed to the nearest service. Right? I mean, uh, solutions like that, or for example, doorstep service. I mean, we, we accelerated a, a service where uh, two gentlemen will come in the motorcycle and get a basic service done outside your house. Right? Uh, so stuff like this. Uh, and, and the starting point really, really was, you know, the answer to the question, KKH, Karna Kya. Sorry, I don't think I can hear you. Sorry about that, Lalit. While while uh, it, it it's it's pretty obvious, uh, 
that that as an auto company uh kashik and the ford motor company would have tried to make it more intuitive more convenient with a single number for people to connect and recreate some of the physical things into the virtual uh, by giving whatsapp workarounds have you have you in your experience uh, now encountered clients in businesses who have had traditionally uh, predominantly physical models who are now trying to figure out the the digital twins for their models and how how that would pan out uh, uh thanks manik i think uh, in the insurance example which uh, vikas gave and then you spoke about how happy were you to hear it uh, you know there's a story that came to my mind uh this was 2005 i i we went to a large i i was working for an agency and we went to a large insurance company and we told them we'll help you build your website and we were very happy with the pitch um and the client also loved it and we were we were pitching to the cto at that time and we lost the business because our quote was about 50000 rupees more than the second guy who had quoted um and i think that was one day Uh, when you know we we wanted companies to go online and do stuff and you know clients had different things in mind so something that happened uh, you know about 4 or 5 years back when we went to a large retailer and we told him hey you know you don't have an e-commerce front end and and you know you have an e-commerce front end but you're not focusing on it it's such a small part of your business uh, why don't you focus on it and they said no we we, are, we, we for us the e-commerce front end is mainly to drive people come to the offline store and not really come and buy online so it's a, it's an enablement platform for us we want them to come offline buying it and today uh, you know the same same retailer actually the business got this business has got completely disrupted for them they can't open the stores um, you know when they were looking at e-commerce as a way to drive traffic to the store suddenly e-commerce is now become the primary medium uh more than that i think it's changed the way they were thinking about the customer proposition right uh, now if they're if they're a complete online business what is the reason for people to actually come and buy from them when you have the amazons and the flipkarts and the mintras of the world there right so clearly it has moved from saying okay i want a website to saying okay i'll use the website to drive traffic offline now to say hey i want to do business online but what do i do because there's no reason for the customer to come and buy online from me Uh, when there are so many marketplaces out there right so that's one big change we've seen right where you know it's come back to basics and saying hey what do i mean for the com- customer uh, why should the customer come and buy my buy products from me and that's that's basically rejig the way you were always thinking uh, another client we've been we've been we've been working with is is an fmeg client right and and they were selling all through marketplaces and they had a large retail business again which they were selling through dealers and so on and so forth clearly um, the 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 fmeg company the marketplace is take such a big margin and they they and they've said okay majority of our business is going to move online then i need to invest in my own direct to consumer platform again somebody we were speaking to for a long time and they said you know d2c is not a priority we sell through amazon and and flipkart and so on and so forth and suddenly now they realize that this is going to be a big part of the business uh, you know d2c is becoming so big and a direct own 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 website is become big also they they starting to think about stuff like ar for people to experience products when they come to the website right and suddenly from saying i'll just be on the marketplaces and i'll sell there to now building your own website and even going ahead and building a customer experience which is ar led Uh, another th- another observation that has happened right we also work with a whole set of fmcg clients both large and small and clearly you know they've said okay we need to be there to the consumer uh, maybe the customer will not buy directly online from a website because the volume uh, the the value of the product is so low so they said how will they use digital to actually come to the customer so they've used basic th- stuff like whatsapp google forms right to basically say hey i am coming to your society we'll set up a shop in your society on this day and this day and can you get all your residents to come and buy for me so while this is an offline experience but digital is such a core part of it because all the order taking everything is happening through a google google form completely right then you have the examples of even companies who are in e-commerce and they've said hey you know uh, i I, you, i don't know if you've seen those big basket vending machines right uh they what they have done is they have done contactless vending machines coming into your uh, uh, residential place and they said now you can buy all the products uh, on the vending machine contactless so they are thinking of coming to you near to you and in a contactless manner still using digital in a big way so while the pandemic has been uh, 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 you know uh, uh, has has created a lot of problems for people but i think for 
for companies now it is the time to really be serious about what they want to do and every organization depending upon their maturity is, is taking big leaps on this front but every model is different it's not the same model that works for everybody right and and that's the big change we are seeing it's back to thinking about the customer it's it's back to thinking about the value proposition it's about thinking new models um, and and really saying what do i do next thank you yeah quite awesome I, I, the 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 fact that the fact that an organization's energy uh, has always been distributed between the trade the distribution and the customer and in this and in these times when when we truly use digital to reduce the distance between the company and the customer down to zero is when the magic begins to happen zaved for you is the next question and it has two parts actually the first is that i know that unilever's been a uh, uh, been a proponent of using data truly exponentially over over the years to make their distribution efficient and relevant how you been doing that and the second is that the given the fact that a large part of distribution now is has been disrupted for a good part of the last 3 to 4 months in your direct to consumer strategy what is the role that the brand plays to get customer preference because i know that in shop experiences have in the past provided for a large part of that okay so many interesting questions and quite a uh, two very deep uh, perspective so let me tackle data first and um, I, I, and i think uh, and let me pick up some of the thread that vikas talked about and uh, the n is equal to 1 i i think the biggest relevance of data that comes to us is what is the economic value of that data because it is not the volume of data it is also about the quality of the data so how do i really really know and and especially for us who are mass marketer we are trying to move to massive hyper personalization which means that you, we need to really move into a certain sort of uh, segments of cohorts that actually creates an economic value in terms of really really trying to pull people down from the upper funnel to the lower funnel hence the relevance of the data is not necessarily a breadth of data it is actually really figuring out what is the quality of the data that is required for the jobs that needs to be done for the brands and making sure that for those data points i actually have a holistic end to end consumer understanding because i'll tell you uh, theoretically i might know an individual person's certain detail but i may not know behavior so i actually need to make sure that individual individual traits and the more depth i get on traits i'll be able to really really hyper personalize for that individual that leads to the second portion of it which i is the, actually the most important one which is the role of the brand and context and and the big thing is actually content you know if, if i look at a d2c sort of environment it is an extremely personal environment it's not like mass marketing na television mein mai dal diya and everybody is seeing an advertisement is one way but it is is really in a very way one to one communication and hence that has to be less intrusive and we need to really really create value which will actually entail for the person to engage and interact and also give me data so the example that you get is a fantastic example of aragya sethi that you gave which is there is a certain value that your driver got and hence he was able to um, uh, impart with his personal uh, data itself now that can only happen when they are actually getting some value mm-hmm. just for perspective almost half of the sales impact on the lower funnel is actually driven by content and that is such a critical enabler to really really move people into from upper funnel to lower funnel and i'll tell you what we mean by with some examples so let me pick up some of the numbers that mega quoted and another number is if i look at immunity searches over the last few months in india has gone up by 800% so unbelievable when i've never seen that level of immunity search now the moment actually went up what we actually also saw the relevance of people are looking for solutions in chai so we've got something called a red label nature care we immediately knew that people were looking for it because that has got natural ingredient that enables people to build immunity people are looking for it. now that horlix is in our stable we actually have have horlix which is enhanced zinc that enables you to have better immunity protection so the moment you are able to really pick up some of this signal it is really really important to make sure that you have the right relevant connect whether it is a product or communication that targets 
to the individual. In fact, another example that Vikas talked about is how you really are able to, and I think that's a capability, thankfully, we now have, that you can actually have very targeted communication. But having said that, that communication has to be in a way which put into perspective what that consumer required. So when we actually saw, I'll tell you another example, um, as the whole pandemic started, obviously overall people's salience on washing hands and sanitizing hands actually went up. Now, the instance was obviously on the face to go, but LiveWare had taken a stand that, listen, what you need to do is not necessarily with LiveWare, Lux or Doves or Care, any soap, start washing your hands. In fact, if you look at what has happened to the market, by the way, that market on hand wash or whether sanitizer has exploded, unbelievably has exploded. So the whole context being that the data is, is really a critical one to enable us to make sure that we find the economic value, then make sure that we are able to connect the right kind of content that influences at the end what we are looking for in D2C, uh, the second uh, the commerce itself. So I think that's a bit of perspective for me on data and content. Thank you very much. So pick up big signals that are relevant to your business, uh, personalized through target, targeted conversations and drive value through content so that the consumer so that the consumer is willing to participate and pull them down from upper funnel to lower funnel thank you very much harish to you now in the it's it's a very fascinating category that that you drive sales in uh, and for a for a large part of time during the pandemic one might also assume from the outside that it must have been tough to engage customers uh, spe specifically during this pandemic kind of situation. How have you solved that challenge? How have you, uh, how have you come, uh, come around some of these uh, mental challenges and psychographic challenges on your customer segment uh, to remain relevant? Sure. So, um, uh, first of all, uh, thanks everyone for sharing your thoughts. A lot of uh, things that we can echo with. Uh, Manik, to your question, uh, e-commerce is a is an industry where uh, we are always uh, immersed in data, right? First party and third party data. Um, hearing everyone else in the panel talk about how they have been uh, dealing with uh, data and especially D2C and data strategy, for us, this is our bread and butter, right? Uh, when I heard Vikas talk about N is equal to 1, uh, the way I think about data and engagement uh, is uh, that we have a magic wand in our hand right uh, if you if you if we all step back 10 years in our careers and think uh, you know if somebody told us what would future of marketing look like we would still be thinking about uh, broad based uh, targeting messaging going across uh, segments uh, talking to every user in their own language with the context in the messaging that we want to give them would be unheard of right we would have it would have been a, a wish list for us. We are living in a world where um, data and digital enables that kind of uh, custom messaging, targeting. So for me, in a way, we are living in the uh, magic world of uh, marketing present and future. But at the same time, where we falter as an industry is, is the fundamentals. So if we can go back and uh, understand our customer needs much more deeply. If we can spend more time understanding what they want and where they come from, um, the answers will present themselves. So going back to the Mintra story, you're right. Um, when lockdown happened, uh, fashion was a non-essential service. Uh, we were not uh, selling anything. Uh, our transaction were, transactions are almost uh, next to nothing. Right. So uh, that was most of April and partial month of May. So from there, even though we were not transacting, uh, we went back to the customers and tried to understand what are they looking for? Why do users on Mintra love coming to Mintra even when uh, you know there's nothing to buy? So we understood that they love to browse. They find the app experience fantastic. Uh, it is an experience next to uh, none. In fact, I would even say globally uh, amongst fashion platforms, this is one platform where the app experience is fantastic, right? Secondly, uh, they are here to engage with us because they like our content. They like our influencers. They like the stories that we tell. Uh, and they like the uh, kind of uh, engagement activities we do with them. Third, we understood was they are looking for very specific uh, things on safety, on COVID, and so on. 
So how this translated into a plan was there were multiple phases, uh, but the underlying uh, customer uh, view that we took was we want to be helpful to our customers, no matter what we do. So when we started off, it was all about messaging and content and engagement around safety, COVID. So we had uh, specific work from home stores, which had apparel that would be useful for work from home, even uh, stuff that you could do with your uh, current uh, wardrobe, right? Then we put out content, which is uh, gaming. So we put out games on the platform. Uh, we, uh, there was a platform that we launched internally, which is like a mini uh, fashion uh, content platform called Mintra Studio, which initially would have taken more, many more months to launch, but the entire company came together and uh, launched it in the month of uh, April, May. Right. So if you go to the app now and click on Studio, you'll see that there's thousands and thousands of pieces of content that is available for you to consume. Click and buy uh, immediately. So that was launched during COVID. Uh, we also uh, had uh, launched this big uh, reality show last year uh, called Mintra Fashion Superstar, one of the biggest uh, IPs that we own. That was uh, promoted on the platform. So within a matter of few weeks, we became a engagement-led commerce platform right? Uh, during COVID. And immediately after that, again, keeping in the lines of uh, helpfulness to the customers, we launched masks. We were one of the earliest ones to launch masks on the platform with uh, partnership with Wildcard. Then immediately after that, our marketing communication when we reopened was all about lockdown stories. How, uh, when you are still in lockdown, Mintra can help you groom your face or uh, wear a brighter shirt or be ready for your girlfriend or whatever. Like the, all those stories were about immediately after lockdown. And post lockdown, we launched India's biggest fashion sale and we gave them the best offers in the categories that are relevant. So uh, we saw a huge spike in uh, kids wear, home wear, comfort wear, uh, nightwear, um, uh, t-shirts, shorts, kurtis, uh, athleisure. So in a way, understanding the customer using first party data and then serving them according to what they were looking for and how we can help, be helpful to them uh, is what uh, has brought us here in a very successful way post uh, those three months of COVID. Thank you, Harish. So while, while actually the interesting thing is while Megha pointed out a new customer segmentation basis persona and uh, uh, and that's quite fascinating curious cautious and conscious uh, you pointed out another fulcrum of classifications in the business and while lalit was talking about businesses that are predominantly physical or predominantly digital and you are a digital native business the other kind of classification that has emerged now is are you essential or non essential and that has made that has made you know, the challenge for marketers even bigger and, 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 and more complex. And in that, in, you know, in that world, as we continue to progress on our data strategy, the engagement strategy, and, and wrap around offers and communications based on that, the customers now beginning to demand integrated experiences more than ever. Uh, Mega, have you seen examples of brands and organizations uh, provide uh, provide you know world class integrated experiences to consumers? And after that, Lalit, if you can think of some examples that all of us can learn from. Sure. So, uh, so uh, Manik, just when you talk about this new segment of consumers or new segments of consumption in essential versus non essential, um, the the vantage point I would like to look this look at this from is that the, at the core of it, the big shift that has happened, and I think essential versus non-essential will be more of a transitionary phase for now, but the essential core big shift that has happened is both from the consumer side and both from businesses side. The shift to digital has become very real. And and if you, if you look at the entire, you know, the US retail, which is a much more, you know, evolved, uh, digitally evolved market, 11% of their overall retail sales is, is driven by e-commerce. Uh, are we saying that India today will move from 3% to 11% uh, or 12% or 20% overnight? No, I don't think that's going to happen. But what will happen is that the, the influence of digital in every physical purchase will become far more pronounced. In the US, it stands at around 89%. In India, we are at 60s and 70%. But that push will happen sooner. And what will add to that pace of transformation is really the consumer momentum. 
So in industries where consumer habits were, you know, typically the biggest barrier in making the shift to digital, like groceries, like fitness, healthcare, education, payments, they are all witnessing a shift in this consumer habit. And as consumers are being pushed to try digital alternatives. And as the dust settles, a new normal will be established. The new normal will be different for different industries, but digital is definitely uh, here to stay. So as we look at, we work with you know, a spectrum of brands across different uh, industries. And I think one of the, the things that, that that will become center stage, again, going back to this digital transformation and which we already see brands doing it as we speak, is creating, thinking of creating consumer experiences that start from, for the want of a better word, finger falls to footfalls. And the core foundation will be tech that will enable these integrated experiences across a consumer life cycle. So I think Zavid talked about hygiene taking, you know, hygiene searches surging through. I feel hygiene has become important in two contexts, both the digital world as well as the offline world. If you look at hygiene in the digital world, brands will have to think about customer experience uh, on, on their websites, on their apps. And when it, when it comes to customer experience on website and apps, the biggest uh, breaking point is, you know, uh, am I providing a frictionless experience today? And it really boils down to the content on my website, the content on my app and my site speed. In the physical world, however, this would mean that Am I following the hygiene practices that my new, newly aware conscious consumer expects me uh, to, uh, you know, to deliver? So I, I think uh, uh, that really is, is, is the core of what brands are uh, trying to do. And the foundation of it, which Vikas uh, touched about when he spoke, is really about how do you first build a very deep integrated audience strategy? And, and as, we, as we talk, we see brands doing that actively. How do I build a unified view of my customer as he straddles from offline into online or online to offline? Because the first port of entry or the first possible interaction with the brand for a customer today is possibly going to be digital. So that first port of entry needs to be stitched up on hygiene and like how. So, you know, one is, am I looking at my data uh, very well? How, how's, what is the sanctity of my first party data? Am I identifying, does my CRM tool give me the ability to identify high value users? Am I implementing the right, you know, tags and analytics on my uh, website? Am I, am I, you know, using, moving to a more data driven attribution models as I look at my media investments in this new mix of channels that my consumers is, tra is traveling between? And most importantly, am I leveraging ML to predict the lifetime value of my users and also use the right media mix to say that I'm chasing the right users that will deliver the profitability that I need to chase over the long term. So I, I think, um, and, and Lalit and Zavid both touched about, uh, about it. And I, I think Hadish gave a fantastic example of how Mintra has been doing this really well. You, you need to keep communication contextual. And in this uh, day and age, brands cannot afford to be, to be tone deaf. And hence, managing the first party data and leveraging it to build a sound view of your consumer context uh, for you to enable to enable you to you know give more deliver more personalized and contextual messaging becomes very very critical and the heart of it all of it is is data and how I'm treating my digital strategy as an organization. Sure, sure, Lalit, your views. So I'll give I'll I'll, I'll give two uh, very uh, real examples, right? Um, you know, and 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 not uh, you know just. Uh, can in that sense. I think one client that we're working with, right, it's an FMEG company. They've never sold directly to consumers. Uh, the sale has always been through dealers. And one of the key influencers uh, in their journey has been the service providers who really go and install the product and, 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 and you know, recommend the product, right? Uh, clearly, with this pandemic happening, people are not inviting service providers to directly come to their house so easily, right? Because there's this care of COVID to come in. Right. So clearly the business model has changed. Right. And what do you do? So one thing that we that uh, that they're doing is saying that, hey, can I choose? Because also the product can't be installed without a service provider. 
so uh, one of the things they are doing is suddenly they are going to go, going to all the service providers who are always in their database but now they are basically creating them as authorized champions for the business so there's a huge move to try and own the service providers who were never owned by you train them equip them have basic things like aroge setu app with them uh, do checks with them whether they are you know whether they're doing well and so on and so forth and really get them to be the agents so instead of company calling a local service provider you're calling the com- uh, individual calling a local service provider you're calling the company who's basically sending you an authorized personnel who's actually not an employee of the organization so that's a huge change we're seeing in an organization which is never had any connect with the consumer directly the second example is 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 is, a, is this retailer and clearly um, they've had amazing amount of customer data because the customers bought for them Uh, uh bought products from them for, for over the years they have exact information of what the customer buys what do they like when do they buy what they buy what do they buy for the family for the kids for the husband for everybody else right um, and clearly now is the time when, when they are actually looking at all this data and saying okay let's segment all my customer segments and saying what does it really mean for each of these customer segment differently and what is the reason for the customer to come and buy online for me So basically, there, there was a there's a very interesting survey uh, or or a research done by KPMG some time back, which they looked at the uh, NPS score, and there were basically you know uh, six elements of how P, how NPS uh, would really move. So they looked at empathy, which said showing that you care, choosing the right emotional response to meet the customer circumstances. There was personalization. There was the time and effort, which is making it easy for the customers to access information, get essentials, access customer communities and networks. uh then third was expectations uh, fourth was expectations then it was resolution of queries and lastly was integrity that means doing the right thing ensuring the need for many are met what they've done is basically they've taken this whole nps journey and now looking at different customer segments and saying which customer segment what do i need to do to really give them that specific value proposition for my business so clearly data is going beyond just marketing but basically being looked as the way of doing business and the way of building a customer experience completely So clearly, what we are seeing is different customer experiences tailored made to organizations, and data being the core and the heart of it. Thank you, thank you, Lalit. Uh, I'm afraid we're running out of time. So what what I want to do quickly is to look at some of the questions on the board, and in in a manner of speaking, a rapid fire round. I want to post uh, some of these questions to you so that so that you give the audiences the answers before we wrap up in the next five minutes. uh is uh, vikas still still with us is he is he on the vikas are you there very much manik i'm very much here awesome awesome vikas the first questions for you and rapid fire uh, somebody is asking a lot of initial product design depends on demographics and i think this is coming from your your comment on you know correlations are a lot more important than causation uh it, the question is Uh, when you backfit some of this do you find it consistent with your demographic understanding of the consumer and what do you do with it yeah no i i think uh, i think you are right we need to start with certain assumptions but um, as all the models will tell you that you do a ab you do the testing on the 5% you see the responses to that and then you progressively in- increase it to 10 so number of times where we have made assumptions which didn't work out we made assumptions of breaking the journey for men and women on the home screen uh, we made a assumption of breaking the journey between fashion and electronics on the home screen and um, uh, these assumptions when you take it to the customers don't work out so yes we do those tests um, we get that data and make the changes if uh, the customer likes it or we don't go ahead with it if the customer doesn't like it testing is the only solution actually i i quite agree with you lalit the the second questions for you very very quickly how about doing a cost benefit analysis for the entire logistics that somebody needs to put out there and the investments in technology for a data led strategy and you mentioned you mentioned uh, uh, first party data you mentioned crm you mentioned lifetime value all of this will will, will require costs uh, do you do a cost benefit analysis and convince your customers and have you done that yeah so i think uh, two contexts right one uh, you know you either sell on the marketplaces uh, where and the entire data belongs to the marketplace or you sell directly where the data belongs to you what what having your own d2c uh, allows you to do is is get to capture that data 
and that data is invaluable. As I told you the example uh, earlier, right, where I spoke about saying it's not just about using data to acquire better customers or to retain uh, the current customers. Data can be used to really build multiple things for the business, right, from figuring out what people want to buy, why do they want to buy from you, what do they like about your product, how often do they buy, and so on and so forth. Now, if you take this example, this data is invaluable, not just for now, but for the lifetime, right? And Harish, you, in the marketplace, as he said, right, we are we, we think data first and then we do everything else. Now, it is correlate this to an offline example, right? You're building a factory, right? The big problem companies do is that you build a factory and you amortize the cost of the factory over a number of years. But when it comes to digital, suddenly you're saying, I kal return on right? Or kal mirko iska profit on now, why don't you think about that from the factory when you're basically amortizing it over a 10 year period and you have information that is invaluable for you for your lifetime? I think that's the same story. There may be added logistics costs, there may be other costs that will come in, but decide what is it for? Is it about just an ROI tomorrow? Or is it basically building a business and saying, this is like a factory for me and it will give me output over the next 10 years? Sure, so you are saying you can very well build a, a cost benefit analysis over three to five years for the investments required in a data strategy. The next right. one for the next one is uh, for you, Zaved. When you look at when you look at an e-commerce, uh, when you look at e-commerce, do you look at it only as platforms to engage with new uh, and test for new brands, understand TG, or you're looking at it specifically as revenue channels? Uh, for for your business, yeah. So uh, my perspective on uh, e-commerce is the, the three C's. One is content because it's really critical because that's what drives traffic. Second is you need to have a collaboration of brands. You need to have a product, service, or solution that will solve the problem that consumers have. And the third thing is commerce. Commerce is an output, but it needs to have content. It needs to have a collaboration of brands or services leading to commerce. So that's my take on e-commerce. How we should. So you are saying eventually, yes, revenue lines is the answer. For, uh, absolutely. I think for every dollar that we spend, we must make sure that it actually tra translates into revenue. And yeah, that's the intent at the end of the day. But on its own, just revenue is not sufficient. We need to make sure that we have the right ecosystem that enables people to really do, uh, do it. Because if I just have a commerce site, it doesn't mean that people are going to buy it. People actually need the content to really buy it so that I'm able to really figure out what solution am I giving. I have to have the solution there as well so that people buy into the promise that I'm giving. So it's a whole ecosystem that needs to work in tandem to lead to commerce. Got it. Got it. The last, the last questions for Kaushik. Kaushik, the, this one is very deep and, and interesting. Uh, uh, the question reads like this, that, that actually car purchases uh, and things like that are done in the belief that tomorrow is going to be better than today. With this pandemic situation, all the stuff that you've done to improve hygiene, improve connectivity, show empathy, uh, and replicate replicate experiences for customers in the digital medium. How, as a marketer, do you tackle that belief? And is that coming in your way? Has that changed? Tomorrow is going to be better than today. I think all of us fundamentally, um, you know, we are all optimistic people. And if you're not optimistic, you can't be, you know, at the end of the day, we all believe tomorrow is going to be better than today. Uh, the industry is, is I would say, you know, while it's recovering, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Uh, what we can do today really is, is uh, you know, stay in tune with the consumer behavior, changing consumer behavior, and uh, try to maximize uh, as much business as you can. Uh, at the same time, you know, be empathetic because, you know, you, you really don't want to you know, lose that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Vikas, for an excellent presentation. Thank you, all my fellow panelists, for, for sharing with us the kind of insights that you did. Thank you, Monica, for getting all of us together and preparing for, for this one. I, I, hope, uh, I hope the audience had fun because I'm quite certain I did. Uh, thank you very much. Over back to you, Monica. Thank you, Manik. 
and it indeed was a wonderful session i think the the audience has typically done like a crash course in the last 40 minutes given the number of things we touched upon and the way we covered this topic it was fabulous and uh, totally appreciate all the inputs uh, manik thank you for sharing the session so completely and panelists thank you very much for sharing absolutely wonderful and insightful learnings with us and if i have to sum this up as i sign off the session what i would want to say it's key to have deep and broad understanding of marketing principles business objectives along with robust technology tools as essential elements of a strategy for developing meaningful relationships with your customers and delivering friction free cross channel experiences that's essentially what we have actually try to elude at and the best customer experience is when the customer doesn't think it was one so that's how i'd like to conclude this session and uh, i look forward to having you all back again soon uh, i'd like to thank the ad audience for their time if you missed the session we will still all send across the recording for it or you can watch it live as we streamed it on on our social media handles so stay tuned every thursday as we take you through the journey of modern marketing and i'd again like to say a big thank you to vikas manik and all our panelists for sharing such a wonderful session with us as we bring this to a close here is a snapshot of the next session which is on thursday on 13th of august and we're going to be touching upon cloud for marketing in the in the in the discussion last but not the least here's a reminder of the various ways in which you can engage with mma and stay in touch with us to our newsletter social media handles and strategic programs so stay tuned as we bring more to you on the journey of the future of modern marketing thank you and have a lovely day ahead thank you very much thank you everyone thank you thank you